Life is often about plan B, isn't it? And we just sort of have to adapt. And today's focus is about joy and be, be joyful in all things, right? And this is, this is really not a big problem when you think about the world situation. This is very fixable. So we're thankful for that. But I want to welcome everyone here today. And really, it's our hope and our prayer that every, everyone will be blessed by the Lord in some sort of significant and meaningful way.
the Bible declares in Psalm 34, verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So whatever your circumstance today, let's just praise the Lord. We invite you to praise the Lord with us. It is so good to give praise to the Lord because he's good. He is good, he's marvelous. And we wish you a very warm welcome to our church today. Our call to worship is found in Psalm 100 and Alan will be reading it for you. Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise and magnify your name because of who you are. We come into your presence this morning and we ask that you, your Holy Spirit dwell in our midst. Give us clarity of mind so we can understand your word that will be preached to us today and so we can apply it in our daily lives. Bless this worship and accept it as we pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Kathy, and I'm here for the children's story. If I could have Valencia come up to hold Ella the elephant to remind the children that we need to be reverent in church. We need to walk, raise our hands, that kind of thing. That'd be great. Thank you. And don't forget, children, to collect the dollar bills that the adults are holding out for you. This is the first time that I've done the children's story in a long time where I can remind you to do that. So I am joyful that that is the case.
dial it for me today. That helps. Just, thank you. And Ella, it's here to remind us to listen during story time, like I said. All right. I am going to need somebody to raise your hand. Does anybody know what the, no, you don't even know the question. What does the word procrastinate mean? If any children don't know, adults, feel free to raise your hand that are up here. Procrastinate. Hmm, anybody know? No? What? To put off, thank you. Or be lazy, delay, thank you. Well, if anybody knows, on Thursday, I was listening to the news, and in the news, it said that it was National Lazy Day. I'm like, come on. There's no such thing as National Lazy Day, but there must have been. But anyway, today's story is about me being joyful, but it's also about listening and procrastinating. Well, it's about Max and Anna, too, my oldest nephew. And my youngest nephew, Jackson, please forgive me for it talking about you procrastinating, because that's what he did. But he knows, I, I will start now. All right. I'm going to start by sharing a short Bible story found from Luke 2, 41 through 49. Jesus and his parents, they were out. They had been to celebrate the Passover. Does anyone know, want to guess how old Jesus was at that time? How old was he? How old do you think he was? Um, 12. 12? That is right. Good job. Thank you. Jesus was 12 years old, and he loved being in the temple. Well, Jesus' parents decided, you know, we're go it's time to go. Passover is over with. Let's go home. And they thought that Jesus was with them. Way, why do you think it took them three whole days to figure out where Jesus was? Any idea? Yes. Why? Jesus was at the temple. Yeah, but why did it, why did it take his parents so long to find him? I know, it's a trick question. I know. Yes, honey. Because they had already left. Yep. And they were with a large group of people, and they thought that Jesus was with them. So anyway, Jesus was missing. They had to travel for three days back to find him. They found him in the temple, and they were both joyful, both Mary and Joseph. Jesus told them, I'm going about my father's business. Well, I was excited because I was going to go on a trip. Before I talk about the trip, let's sing Jesus Sends His Angels. You ready? Jesus sends his angels. Come on, start it with me. Angels, angels. Jesus sends his angels to watch us while we're driving. Then we're going to sing playing and then traveling. Jesus sends his angels, angels, angels. Jesus sends his angels to watch us while we're praying. Jesus sends his angels, angels, angels. Jesus sends his angels to watch us while we're traveling. Well, I was so excited. Max was getting married. And when he told me, my oldest nephew, I tried to convince him to get married in the U.S. He said no, because my wife 
my future wife and her family live closer to Germany. I said, well, I guess I better start saving my pennies. I asked my coworkers, my co-teachers, how I was feeling about taking a trip to Germany. One of them said that I was excited. Another one said I was joyful. One of my colleagues said that I was so excited that's all I was talking about and she'd have to remind me, you know, focus on the kids. I said, okay. And finally the scheduler told me, you know, we thought your brother was procrastinating and not getting the ticket, so we had to tell you, we need to know. We need to know like a month before. So anyway, my brother said he wasn't procrastinating. He had to try to figure out what the best flight was. He goes, I was just trying to save you money. And every time I thought I had a good deal, there was another deal that showed up even better. So anyway, he was not being lazy about that. So I was excited, and I was going to fly by myself to Germany. I had, a had to leave from Boston, have a layover, and then go to Frankfurt. So anyway, my brother Bob and family arrived on Monday, and I got there the Friday before. My youngest nephew was in college, and he had a, pro a paper to do, and he procrastinated. He was lazy about it, ah, I don't need to do it, whatever. The night before the wedding, he was still had not done it, and his parents had told him, please do it. There are several th things that I remember about the wedding. One thing was the hospitality of Anna's parents, and the other was that they had a Two weddings, one at a civil wedding in a courthouse, and the other, they had a religious wedding at the SDA church, and I thought that was really cool. So anyway, boys and girls, let's remember the importance of listening to our parents and teachers. Today, we are ba dedicating baby Ethan to the Lord. I hope that his parents and brother Bring him to beginners and the grandmother and the grandfather if they want to come too. All right. Can I have somebody offer to pray for me today? Adrian, I think I'm going to choose. What's your name, honey? Isabella. Isabella, can you pray for me? Mm hmm Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can talk to you and help Ethan to have a safe dedication. In your name we say amen. Amen. Remember to walk back to you. Oh, I forgot something. I have a picture of a church. And come on up and I can hand you your papers before you go, all right? Thank you. Okay, you know, we are really blessed to have children here. And uh, I know it's during summertime, a lot of people are traveling. And I think SLA starts in about 10 days. So we'll start seeing more faces around here. But we are so blessed. And uh, it's indeed a sacred privilege, is it not? And we take that very, very seriously here because <clears throat> about a third or a quarter of our budget goes to South Lancaster Academy, which is pointing people to Jesus Christ while they are learning about arithmetic and writing and reading, and they're pointing them to Jesus Christ. So it's not just about information getting put into our heads. It's about what are, who we are as individuals. So I want to ask a question. How many of us here were once a baby? Yes. So we all know what this is like, so I'm going to invite... Uh, Aaron and John to come forward and bring little Ethan here. We're going to dedicate him to the Lord today and family. And, and Grandpa comes up too, because I believe he's going to say a few words. And uh, we are indeed blessed, my friends. And today, this is indeed a very sacred moment. Because what Aaron and John are going to do here is they are acknowledging that Ethan, Ethan is, a, is a gift of God. I wish the camera, I wish everybody could see this cute guy here. You know that? We should get the camera right in here. 
But hey, how you doing? Been a little bit while. You've changed. Yes. Yes. We're going to dedicate you to the Lord today, all right? Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. So, um, you know, it's interesting that I was reading a story about, how many remember Christopher Reeve? He was the guy who played Superman. And, and there's a sad part of his life because he was not brought up in any sort of religious home. And he actually said in an interview he was actually intimidated, even sort of scared of churches and of God because he'd seen this angry, this angry God somewhere he picked it up. Then after his accident, about two, three years afterwards, he joined a Unitarian church. And, uh, but I'm thinking about, you know, how much he missed out on his life. I mean, here's a man who played the role of Superman. You remember that movie? And, and the special effects were pretty bad <laughs> when you compare it to today. But the point is, is interestingly enough, he played this role of Superman, yet as a person, he was afraid, he, he was fearful, intimidated by churches and by God. It's interesting when we contrast that to what we read here in the New Testament. And now I actually need a third hand. But it's in Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Listen to these words. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such of these. And then he adds to this, I tell you that anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like little children will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. Well, my friends, we don't have Jesus Christ with us here today, physically, but we are the body of Christ. And that's a very important image to have in our minds because together, collectively, we are in a way dedicating Ethan to the Lord. And so we must remember that. And it's interesting to note, too, that the children were attracted to Jesus Christ. They were attracted. They were drawn to him. And so as we are indeed living our lives and life is insanely busy, can I get an amen? It's insanely busy. And it's easy for us to lose focus and to think, to put our focus on the wrong thing. And what is it about? Bringing our children, finding ourselves at the feet of Jesus Christ. And I believe that Grandpa is going to say a few words here about his, his latest grandson. We have a lot to be thankful for today. Uh, not only is this uh, Ethan's special day of dedication to the Lord, coming through a very special experience, um, I would call it in some extent a miraculous experience that was overseen, I believe, by, by, the, by, by the Lord. Um, also, we have family that aren't ordinarily here. Um, we have Lila, John's mother, who's joining us from Hosur, India. And we have Scott, uh, Aaron's uh, brother, and his family that are joining us from Senegal on their way to Kyrgyzstan. So we're indeed thankful to have the family here and to, to have the time that we can to spend with them. But I want to share with you a poem dedicated to Ethan this morning. I'm going to confess that I've used this poem once before in church. It's been three or four years ago. But, um, but I think that it speaks specifically to the future of Ethan and the way in which God's blessed in his birth. So it was written by Myra Brooks Welch, and it goes like this. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while." to waste much time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar? A dollar then two? Only two dollars? Two dollars and who'll make it three? Three dollars once? 
three dollars twice, going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loose strings, he played a melody, pure and sweet, as the caroling angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, and who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried. We don't quite understand what changed the worth, and swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. <clears throat> a mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd can never quite understand the worth of a soul, and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. We're thankful for Ethan in the way that God is blessed in his uh, birth and the way that God's blessing him as he begins the process of growing. And we hope that each and every day along that pathway that he'll continue to be touched by the master's hand. So I'm going to ask some questions here of Aaron and John. And by the way, Olive, we don't want to overlook you. You're the big brother. <laughs> I know. It's a, it's a big calling. I know. I know. But you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. So, and, and you were, if you were as nice to me as you are to, to your baby brother, you're going to be just fine. Just fine. I went over and he was, wanted to play with me with all of the toys. So it was, it was wonderful. So, but John, Aaron, do you acknowledge that Ethan is a gift of God. Do you hear, dedicate him to the Lord? Yes. I'm going to ask the church family, do we here today commit to doing all we can to pointing little Ethan and ultimately big Ethan to Jesus Christ? Amen. 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 Let's have a word of prayer. I'm going to attempt to hold Ethan. And if John, you'd hold the mic. All right, Ethan. Yes, I'll keep this down to two hours, okay? <laughs> All right, okay. Mommy's right there. Father in heaven, Lord on the screen is a picture of Ethan when he was younger than this. But Lord, we know that, as the good book Jeremiah reminds us, that you have a plan for his life. Before he was born, you have a plan for his life. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that today. And Lord, we pray that you will be with little Ethan here as he's growing day by day. Lord, now many of his decisions are made for him. So we pray for his mom and his dad. Give them wisdom, guidance, and protection. And we pray that you will be with his family. I pray for Ollie, his big brother. I pray for his grandparents and the extended family. And Lord, I pray for our church family that we will do all we can to lead Ethan to, to Jesus Christ. Lord, I want to pray, too, that you will protect Ethan. I want to pray that as he is growing up and he starts making his own decisions, that you'll be by his side every moment. And I pray that he will find you to be his best friend. I pray that he will learn to lean on you, listen to you, and follow your lead. Thank you for describing yourself as the way, the truth, and the life. And as little Ethan here has many, many, many years ahead, we pray that he will always follow you on that way. Lord, we thank you for Ethan. We lift him up to you today, acknowledging that he is a gift of God, gift of you, and we dedicate him to you today. We pray that you, the Holy Spirit, the angels will be around him every day of his life. In the saving name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
giving you a certificate here and a Bible. And let's all say amen to our family here. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's give a round of applause and celebration. Thank you. At our college church, we have a motto that is actually a progressive motto. It says, love, grow, serve. First we love, and because of our love, we grow. And as we grow, we realize our need to serve. But the beauty of this motto is that you can reverse it as well, because sometimes we begin at service. We serve because somebody's in need. And as we serve, we grow. And as we grow, love is born. And so our college church looks at the ministry as something very important for sustaining us as a family. And I want to mention a few of the things that our church has going at the moment. First is our mission trip. We know that Celeste Perino will be going to the Dominican Republic on Thursday. And she is going with medical supplies and is in need of donations. And we continue to donate, whether it be by providing caps, baseball caps or med medicines or money. And this can be done if we go into the church's donation uh, online. The next thing is church business meeting. Now, I think many of us will want to attend this business meeting. As we fan, we are thinking, I want to be present at that business meeting. We want to put the pastor on the hot seat. <laughs> Only joking. But it is important that we make it to the business meeting on Tuesday, August 22, at 7 o'clock. And this will be on Zoom. So all are invited to attend this very important business meeting. There's also a special church board meeting. And this will be the day before that. And the board members are reminded 7 o'clock for that Zoom meeting. Also very important, on September uh, 9, our service will not be here, but we'll be in cooler climes at Camp Winnegeg. Am I pushing the point too much, Pastor? <laughs> yes, we will be at Camp Winnipeg, and we are invited, all of us, to be there. It is important, however, that you register, because if you want to eat there, we need to know how many people are going to be there so that meals can be provided. Um, if you register and then find that you're not able to come, you're also reminded to make sure that the church knows this so that that number can be taken off so that we don't spend money on food that will not be eaten. Prayer meeting Wednesday nights. Wednesday night prayer meetings are usually very, very vibrant. Haven't been there a few weeks myself, but I miss it a lot. And this coming Wednesday, September 8th, 9th, sorry, the, the prayer meeting is going to be in an interesting place. <laughs> it's going to be at Kimball's. And I'm wondering which is going to be sweeter, the prayer or the dessert? My suspicion is the prayer. But you are all invited to be there at Kimball's on Wednesday, August 23, 7 p.m. for this special prayer meeting. A uh, few weeks ago, we had a very sad occasion when we lost Inigo to his uh, challenge. Sunday, September 10, at 2 p.m. here in the sanctuary, there will be a special service of celebration for his life. We are asked to uh, 
assist in this by, of course, attending and supporting the family, and also assisting by providing food for the occasion. If you would, would like to do so, you may go online and register. Uh, Debbie Gifford is usually the person that we get in touch with, and you can get in touch with her online or by phone. Please assist in this very important area. And another area that the church is involved is, is in wellness. And I've been asked to emphasize that we need donations for that event. So they're asking for you to donate lightly used teddy bears, no more than 18 inches in size, and there will be a container in the foyer where you can put those things. Or you can donate in a tithe envelope or by clicking make um, more offering categories and make your monetary donations there. We also have work to do at the Clinton Public Schools. And you are reminded that that is not, also another important area where our young people <clears throat> sorry, need assistance. For the boys, we would like to have sweatpants, and for the girls, leggings. And of course, monetary do donations will also be important there. These are some of the things that our church is doing as we work together in love. We will grow, and as we grow, our service will get better and sweeter. Thank you. Join me here, if you're able, and let us kneel. Our Father and our God, we pray that in the quiet of this moment, you will breathe on us your breath of love. Inspire us, Lord, with spirits that will go forth to serve you, to serve you in simple ways as meeting the needs of those we work with, those we are friends with, 
and those who are our family members. Lord, sometimes it is even more difficult to serve and to love those who are closest to us. And so we ask, Lord, for that spirit of love, that spirit of patience, that spirit of endurance that will make it possible for us to go the second mile for those who are in need. Lord, there are those among us who are experiencing physical challenges. Their names appear in our bulletins, but are written indelibly in your heart. And so, Lord, we present them to you today and we ask that even at this moment, Lord, be it in their bedrooms, or be it in the hospital bed, be there with them, we pray. Help them, Lord, to feel your presence. Help them to recognize that you are a God who loves and cares deeply, and that whatever they are experiencing at this time, you are there with them, and all is well. Lord, there are those who are having spiritual challenges. They are not sure, Lord, which direction to take. There are doubts that are creeping in as various experiences bombard them. And Lord, we are asking you to send your Holy Spirit to redirect their minds and their hearts. There are those, Lord, who are having financial challenges. Challenges that at this moment seems so great that they think they're unable to meet them. Lord, we pray that you will touch the heart of the family members here, that we may be your messengers to these people. Help us to provide in whatever way we can for the financial needs of our people. There are those who are going out this coming week to make requests to solve problems, solve problems of home ownership, solve problems of school bills, solve problems of hospital bills. Lord, we pray that you will walk ahead of them and smooth the way so that the plans that they have and the desires that they have will be realized. Lord, we never ever pray without presenting to you our children and our young people. Lord, we recognize that they are the ones on whom the pressure is being placed to turn their hearts from you and to make them doubt as to whether or not there is a God. Father God, we as parents and older ones request that you will provide for them the evidence that they need to stand firm in their faith. We need, Lord, that presence. We need to take hold of your promise that you will contend with anyone who contends with our children and that you will save our children. And so because we know that you love them more than we do, we present them to you. And we ask, Lord, that you will be their support. And Lord, as we sit here today and listen to the message that comes from you, 
kindle in our hearts a desire to go forth and to do your will, we pray. All these things, Lord, that we ask, we ask in your precious name because of the promises you have made us. Amen. Thank you for taking us through another week, Lord, so that we can fellowship together. I just want to say um, today's scripture reading is coming from Psalm 66, verse 1 through 5. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Because of your great and power, your enemies cringe before you. All the earth worships you. They sing praises to you. Sing praises to your name. Come to see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds among mortals.
would like to have an encore of that. That was beautiful. And Richard, thank you. Ilana, thank you. And it, I just needed to mention that Ilana is headed off to Ohio to pursue a second master's degree. So well, she'll be back at Christmas time or the month of December. So we'll miss her, and, and, but we'll, we'll be seeing you again. And, and Milton, thank you for, I don't know how, what happened here, but I think Milton, somebody had the magic touch. And that was good to get the organ up and running. So it's good to be here today, my friends. It is good to be here. I invite you to pray with me as we start. Lord, thank you for the gift of being your sons and daughters. Thank you for being, allowing us to be your children. And Lord, we pray that we will always remember our status, our position in your eyes. Lord, it's so easy for us to forget that. We know that well. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. How are you? How are you doing? More specifically, how is your prefrontal cortex doing? More specifically, how is your left prefrontal cortex doing? You see, that's the area where our positive sentiments and emotions reside, and I'm thinking today about that one three-letter word called joy. How is your joy level doing? Pull out a book off my library shelf and looked at the foreword, and the author writes something like to the effect that now more than ever, we need more joy. You know, he wrote that in 1992. You think it's a little bit better or worse than that? I think it's gotten worse. And I feel as if so often the joy that we're supposed to really enjoy is getting solely sapped from us. Now, I'm not talking about plastering a fake smile on our faces. I'm not talking about that, although we often do that. Did you hear the story, the tale that's told about a man who went to see a psychiatrist? And he says, Doctor, I'm lonely, despondent, and miserable. Can you help me? And so the psychiatrist thinks for a while, and he suggested that he goes to the circus that's in town. There's a famous clown there who was known to make everybody laugh, everybody happy. And the patient looked at him and he said, doctor, I am that clown. <laughs> How we can put a face on, but really there's something going on underneath. So the question is really, is how is your heart? How is your soul? How are you and I doing? You and I have probably heard those expressions. There are badmintists, there's Madventists, there's Sadventists, and there are Gladventists. And we know that. And we all go through all of them. That happened to me just yesterday. I went to pick up a cucumber and I got stung by a bee, and in 60 seconds I zipped through all of those. I'm back to being a Gladventist. But in all seriousness, we, life does that to us, doesn't it? Life does that. And so David understood this, and so he wrote the 66th Psalm. And I invite you to turn with me in, the, in your Bible to the 66th Psalm. I'm reading from the NIV this morning. And it's interesting that Psalm 66 really is two sections. It's verses 1 through 12, which is the first section. That'll be our focus this morning, and then 13 through 20. And, and he's really engaged in the psalm. This is a psalm that's full of verbs, action verbs. Because in Psalm 66, verse 1, he says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Second thing, he says, Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, How awesome are your deeds. How great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praises to your name. And then he says, Come and see what God has done his awesome deeds for mankind. David says, say, sing, shout, come and see, but do so in joy. So we've got to ask a question, what really is joy? What is joy? 
Calvin Miller addressed this and he said, many Christians confuse happiness with joy. He confesses as I did. He says, as a, happiness is a buoyant emotion that results from the momentary plateaus of well-being that characterize our lives. Joy is bedrock stuff. Joy is confidence that operates irrespective of our moods. Joy is the certainty that all is well however we feel. Another person in an article called Joy, the Elusive Fruit, says that it's an attitude, a disposition, a deep, settled confidence uh, that a loving Heavenly Father is in control of the details of life. In other words, joy is knowing that Jesus, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're on the throne, and they are, they are totally tuned into what's going on. They are aware of this. Pastor Tim Keller uh, years ago said this interesting words about our dispositions. He says the Bible is more pessimistic than the most pessimistic person on the planet. But the Bible is more optimistic than the most optimistic person on the planet. He said, suppose a man comes up to you and says, you know what? My life is falling apart. My body is falling apart. My knees don't work. My back doesn't work. My digestive system fall, is falling apart. Everything's falling apart. And so you could say from the Bible's point of view, well, you know what? It's worse than that. Your soul is broken and you're going to hell. It's true, isn't it? We're going to the lake of fire. That's true. But on the other hand, so say the most optimistic man shows up and he says, you know, I've been playing the, the Powerball for 25 years. I've never won a dollar. But I know I've got the billion dollar ticket right here. I know this is the one. And you know what? I know I'm 75, but I'm getting ready for the Olympics. I know I'm going to earn a medal in the Olympics. And I just mailed the manuscript into 100 publishers, and I know I have the next Pulitzer Prize right around the corner. I know it's going to be a bestseller. And I know, I just started a new job. I know one day I will be the president of the company. That's what we call real optimism. But you have to tell the guy, you know what? One day you may not get a gold medal, but one day you will be given a golden crown. One day you will walk on streets of gold. You may not be the president of your company, but you will be over angels. You may not qualify for the Olympics, but one day you will have a body that will allow you to fly from planet to planet all by yourself. The Bible is the most optimistic book and yet at the same time the most pessimistic book. One person put it like this, Christianity is an ultimate optimism founded upon provisional pessimism. Did you catch that? The ultimate optimism founded upon a provisional pessimism. So David understands this, and he says, listen, here's what you got to do. You got to shout, you got to sing, you got to say, because you know what, in the process of doing that, a miracle will happen. And you know what will happen? You will experience joy. Joy will come in. You see, joy is not one of those things that we chase and we achieve it and we check it off our list. No, the moment we try to get joy, it goes away from us. Joy is a byproduct, a result of focusing on something bigger than ourselves, a God that is bigger than ourselves. That's what it's about. And so in verse 5, he says, Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. Now, I got to bore you with a little bit of trivia history because it's really significant that this happened. The, year was, the date was May 24, 1844. It was Washington, D.C. Samuel Morse was in all places. He was in the Supreme Court, the chamber of the Supreme Court. His co-worker, his assistant, Albert Vale, was in Baltimore, Maryland. And it was time to try the first telegraph. The first one. Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Maryland. Samuel Morse begins tapping it out. And you know what he taps out? He taps out this Bible verse. Come and see what God hath wrought. His assistant in Baltimore gets the message 
and he taps back verse 16, which we won't look at today, but he says, come and see what God has done for me. Isn't that interesting? In a place right now filled with so much acrimony and hostility, that Bible verse sent from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore and sent back, come and see what God has done for me. When I was a kid, there was a time that I was pretty sick for about two weeks, and I was starting to get de depressed or discouraged. You know what I'm saying? If you've been sick for a while, you're like, when will this end? And you start losing, you know, dis get, get disconnected from everybody and, and sort of the world. And so it's sort of starting to feel blue. And my mom, who might be watching live stream right now, got a notebook, and she said, okay, Anar, we are going to make a list of all the things to be thankful for all the things to be thankful for. And we sat down, they were made a list, and I think maybe she's got it somewhere still. And after a while, guess who started feeling better? Because there's something about saying and following his instruction, come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. See, the process is to get our focus off of ourselves. Are you guilty of navel-gazing? Are you guilty of having a pity party? Are you, jump, are you guilty of jumping to the worst possible conclusion? Amen, right? Done that, right? We've been there, we've done that. And the problem is when we do that, in all seriousness, in the, when we do that, we give zero room for God in our minds, because we've already filled it up with the worst possible outcome. We've already filled it up with our egos. We've already filled it up with the sorrow we have for the fact that things turned, didn't turn out for the way that we wanted them to turn out. And so God is, David understands something with all that he's been through. He says, you know what? We need to see where, where we put our focus. And we say, well, you know what? I don't want to bother God. I don't want to be bothered by God. I don't want to annoy him. Do you know what? He wants to be annoyed. He wants to be bothered. He wants to be asked. As a matter of fact, one author, Dave Orland, put it like this, Christ gets more joy and comfort than we do when we come to him for help and mercy. See, we think that God is off arms crossed Oh, yeah, you gotta, you're in trouble again. You've got to prove to me that you need help. That's not how he works. C come to him. Come to him. Come and see what God has done. Now, let's be honest with ourselves. Some people have a different religion than we do, and so often we do ourselves. Let me list some of these other religions. Now, religion, remember, is from the word ligio, holding together, holding our lives together. Here's one religion. It's called optimism. Here's another religion, hope. Here's another religion, luck. Here's another religion, fatalism. Here's another religion, work it outism. Here's another religion, control the situationism. The other religion, give it up, throw your hands up. And David says, no, look and see what God has indeed done. That isn't always easy, is it? Several years ago, Time Magazine, produce a whole article on the science of happiness. And in there, there was a whole section, I actually have the copy right in front pew there. The front, it's science of happiness. How are people happy and joyful? And they did a religion a huge favor because they had a nice open section there about religion, about religion. And interestingly enough, they had interviewed a lady named Karen Granger. She was 41 years old at the age. And here's what was going on in her life. Her husband laid off from work. Pregnancy had ended in miscarriage. Her closest cousin was diagnosed with breast cancer. Hurricane hits her hometown. One of her best friends had died of a brain tumor at the age of 50. And yet she attends her church faithfully every single week. She said these words, I've clung to my faith more than ever this year. As a consequence, I haven't lost my joy. Now, what's so cool about this, 
And I can show it to you later if you want to see it. When, they, when the photographer took the picture of her there for the interview, in the background, you see the sky. But in the sky, interestingly enough, are five letters, J-E-S-U-S. -S. A sky rider, it just so happened to be, a sky rider flies through the area that day and actually is writing some message on, in the sky about Jesus. And it's so amazing. So amazing. And so he goes on to say in verse 6, look at what God has done. He turned the sea into dry land. They pass through on the, on the waters, uh, uh, through the waters on foot. He comes, come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. There is no rebellious rise up against him. Praise the Lord, all Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Sometimes, my friends, we just have to focus on the blessings that we've got. But it's not always about that, because look at what he says in verse 10. He says, for you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. The psalmist is honest. You, you, you. You did this, God. You allowed this to happen. But there's a caveat here, and I hope we all caught it. Because it says in verse 10, the second half, you refined us like what? Silver. And in the last part of verse 12, but you brought us to a place of abundance. So the psalmist can see that, you know what? It wasn't all in futility. It wasn't all in vain. It wasn't all meaningless. But that there was something good that came out of it, and it changed them as a people, and it allowed them to have a destiny that God wanted them to have. In Discipleship Journal years ago, there was an interesting article called The Invasion of the Joy Snatchers. Catch that for a moment. The Invasion of the Joy Snatchers. Did you catch that? That's pretty powerful. Invasion of the Joy Snatcher. The seven items here. Here they are. Anxiety and fear. You know what I'm saying? Anxiety and fear. These things can come into our lives, pull the joy right out. And let me be honest with us, my friends, there are burdens that we are carrying right now that only the devil wants us to carry, not God, right? Come unto me, all ye that are burdened, right? Lay it at his feet. Second thing, comparing and coveting. Comparing and coveting. This is a joy snatcher. You know what I'm talking about? Boy, I was, happy until, I was happy with my new car until I saw my neighbor had a new Ferrari, right? And so once we start doing that comparison, the joy just leaves us. And we live in a world, my friends, where comparison is key to how the economy, how the whole world system operates. And it's so easy for us to get sucked into it. The third thing is sin. Sin, when we look at it in terms of relationship, we've violated, we've, we've fractured that relationship. Four is busyness, overcoming, over, over, now we're over commitment. Five is holding on too tightly. Six is joyless people, we won't go into that. And seven is unbelief. I'm saying that because have you ever had your joy snatched from you? Absolutely, absolutely. My joy has been snatched from me at times. But thankfully, we begin to refocus and we begin to see what God has done. We sing to him, we talk to him, we praise to pray him, pray to him, we sing, and we see what he has done. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there any empirical evidence that religion makes a difference? There is in a way. Back in 2005, in the Time Magazine issue, they found out that religious people are less depressed, less anxious, and less suicidal than non-religious people, and they are better able to cope with such crises as illness, divorce, and bereavement. It's a very important thing that, he, that they said there. We are better equipped 
to, to deal with illness, divorce, and bereavement. It's not that they don't happen, but we're better equipped to do, deal with it. And for those who are dealing with depression, they say that religious people will be a little bit less depressed than, than the non-religious people. What's going on? Religion helps us to experience positive emotion and a better satisfaction with life. Illness, bereavement, divorce can still happen. But somehow or another, God can take those things and use them to help us be refined like silver and be changed as individuals. Now, my friends, I don't know about you, but I have found myself in Psalm 66 many, many times. And sometimes it's just hard to say, thank you, Lord, because there's something inside of us that says, I want what I want. And we have that hard time of letting go, and we're focused more on the things that we don't have than on the things that we do have. But the psalmist is inviting us to a whole new way of living, a whole new way of living. There was a conference of, Presbyterian, of a Presbyterian church in Omaha, and the people, they did something different there. It must have been outdoors. It was, they did something rather different. Every person in that conference was given a helium balloon. And they were going to have a worship service. And during the worship service, when they experienced joy in their own lives, they would let the balloon go. So it's kind of an interesting thing. We won't do that here because we've we got a lot of balloons to deal with. But they did that. And so, you know, Presbyterians are kind of like New England Adventists, all right? We're not very emotional. They're not going to say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. They're not going to do that. That's not the, how they are. We're kind of like that. So during the service, they were having the worship service, and balloons started going up randomly. Interestingly enough, when the service concluded, about one-third of the balloons were unreleased. One-third. They had never felt the joy. They never felt the joy. Now, my friends, today we don't have balloons to release, to let go. But as we're singing our closing hymn, I hope that you will experience the words of our closing hymn and that symbolically you will release your balloon. Because it says there, I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place and he has made me glad. My friends, as we're singing that hymn, Let's think about those words, not just read them, not just sing them, but let us mean them. And let us release our balloon saying, I know about the joy that God wants me to have.
there was a man who lived in the third century and he was anticipating death. And he wrote these words to a friend. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I've discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians, and I am one of them. I invite you to pray. Lord, we do not know the man who wrote these words but we know that that group of Christians had same, the same access to you that we do right now. Lord, it is easy for us, all of us within this room, to focus on the things that we wish were better that we don't have. David could even have done the same thing. But Lord, we pray that we will not go down that road we pray that we will listen to what the psalmist had advised us to actually focus on the blessings that are ours, that we've experienced the pleasures, the joys, the victories, the celebrations. And so, Lord, as we do that, as we go forth from here, we may find our minds and our hearts being distracted all over the place. We pray that we will remember Psalm 66, the beautiful words that David told us to put into practice. Lord, we pray that, they, that our joy will only increase day by day. We're not talking about happiness. We're not talking about winning the lottery. We're just talking about joy. May it increase day by day. We pray this in the saving name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.